Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Denise Burkover, and I would like to um, thank you for joining us for today's Noontime Collection Talk with Edward Burchinski on behalf of the RIC. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that while our um, program today is virtual, we are broadcasting from Ryerson University, which is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The university has recently acknowledged its role in the history of Canada's residential school system and committed to a number of actions, including the decision to change its name in the coming months to redress that legacy of um, in furtherance of truth and reconciliation. Additionally, we at the RIC accept our shared ongoing responsibility for this land where our institution stands. We are committed to doing our part to bring about a better future for all people who live here during this time of environmental upheaval and crisis. Today's event is the second virtual noontime collection talk of this academic year. As you may know, these talks traditionally take place in the RIC's Peter Higdon Research Center, which you can see in my virtual background. Started by the RIC's founding collections curator, Peter Higdon, these talks offer our visitors an opportunity to view works from our collection without barriers while learning about them from a variety of perspectives. While we are not able to offer that vital in-person experience again quite yet, we are excited for this opportunity for focused discussion today on one of the RIC's most exciting new acquisitions, a career-spanning multi-year donation of works by acclaimed Canadian photographer Edward Bertinsky. He is joined in conversation today um, with the RIC's director, um, Paul Roth. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few program notes. Please note that we are recording today's event for future reference and upload onto our online programs and platforms. After the talk, we will commence a Q&A. If you have questions throughout the lecture, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen to submit them. In the case of a technical difficulty, we thank you for remaining patient with us while we correct the issue. And lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to remind you all of our next virtual event, which is actually happening tomorrow night at 7 p.m., um, our Tannenbaum Lecture with American photographer Wendy Ewald. This event is hosted in conjunction with Stephen Bolger Gallery, and registration information is available on our website, and uh, there's a link in the chat below as well. We hope to see you all again there tomorrow. Um, and now it is my great pleasure to turn things over to uh, Paul Roth and Ed Bertinsky. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Denise. Um, uh, I'm Paul Roth. I'm very, very happy to be greeting everyone. And um, uh, in particular, I'm uh, really pleased to be uh, in conversation with, uh, with Ed. Um, uh, we don't see Ed's face yet, but I'm sure his video will come on in a minute. Um, I have uh, known Ed's work since I first saw the uh, touring edition of uh, the National Gallery of Canada uh, show that was done, a mid-career survey of Ed's work um, many, many years ago, and it traveled all over um, Canada and the United States. Uh, I saw it in Brooklyn, and it really changed my way of thinking about landscape. And eventually I ended up working with Ed myself. We, uh, we uh, worked together to present his bodies of work, different bodies of work around the subject of oil at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, DC. And uh, since then, I've been fortunate to be in a kind of an ongoing conversation with that about any number of subjects uh, related to his work, um, but also related to larger, larger issues. Um, uh, I've learned a lot of what I know about uh, global climate change uh, from talking to Ed, from reading authors that Ed referred me to, just as one example. Uh, but one of the great subjects that we've shared an interest in over the years is the subject of artistic legacy, uh, the idea that uh, an artist's work has a life after the artist, uh, which is a really fascinating thing and a very complicated subject. Uh, Ed and I have been talking about this for many, many years, including uh, when we first did our exhibition together. Um, that actually grew out of an extended conversation he and I were having about Ansel Adams. Um, and he ended up coming and speaking at an Ansel Adams uh, show that we had at the Corcoran. Uh, that introduction led to us working with Ed on his project oil. Um, so for me, it was really gratifying when our conversation uh, in recent years turned to the question of Ed's own legacy uh, and what would happen to his work, uh, to his archive, to his finished prints um, after he was gone. And uh, ultimately we 
uh, ended up coming to the decision, uh, and I'm so grateful that Ed did feel this way, that the Ryerson Image Center was the most logical place for people to study his work in the future. Uh, as Denise mentioned, uh, his collection is coming to the RIC over a period of several years. Uh, we're quite excited about that um, because it is uh, a constant and ongoing engagement with the living artist, not only with uh, the early work of that living artist, but with the ongoing work as well. Uh, and that's uh, also quite necessary, I have to say, because that is an enormously prolific artist. Uh, and there was simply no way to take in his collection all at once. And as you can see, Ed is still alive and well and kicking and uh, still using his archives himself. Uh, so um, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Ed, uh, who's going to talk about some of these larger issues and also uh, the beginnings of his career, which are represented in the first two uh, donations that have been completed. Um, the third donation coming up soon. Uh, I believe I even already have an appointment to go over to Ed's studio uh, to work on that third donation. Uh, thanks again, Ed, for being here. Take it away. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's uh, really exciting to be here today to talk about this um, important moment in my life and my career to um, have my collection to be residing at Ryerson, at the Ryerson Image Center. And I just want to say something about the Ryerson Image Center. Uh, I'm so pleased that Paul is a director of it and such a great team around him. Uh, so thank you, Paul, for, for making this all happen. And even before Paul, I worked closely with Doina Popescu, who was at the very beginning of it. And I was on the advisory board at the very beginning. So I, I was uh, on a team of people who uh, dreamed about what Ryerson Image Center could be and the contribution that it would give to the university and to the city and to the country and, and, and internationally as well. So uh, I'm so pleased to see years later how well it's doing, how it's become such an important um, institution uh, for photography uh, in the world, I would say. And, um, and to be part of that, it, it makes a lot of sense for me, as Paul had said. And, and what I'll be doing is uh, right now I'm going through the slideshow and this is all the stuff from my early works. And from time to time, I'll step into it and talk about it. Um, and, uh, but also just tell stories about how I got to Ryerson and the importance that Ryerson had for me in my career. By the way, what you're looking at here is one of my very first uh, year projects, the, the Welland Canal. And that takes me to, um, uh, like, how did I get to Ryerson and what happened? So I was born in St. Catharines across the lake. So I remember being uh, on the beaches in St. Catharines and looking across Lake Ontario and seeing the towers on the other side. But Toronto never attracted me. I kind of skirmished it once in a while. I would never even seen it, the downtown, until I was 17. And, um, but when I did finally see the downtown, I remember standing uh, in the middle of, of Commerce Court, looking up at the IMP Tower and the, the Mies Towers and, and thinking, wow, I finally get to see those towers that I used to see from across the lake. But it's also important to, to say that that living in St. Catharines, which was by, at that time, a blue collar town. And my father worked at GM and I got a chance to see uh, the factory he worked in where they poured uh, metal to engine blocks, they made engine blocks and steering knuckles, uh, which were done with a big forge and red hot ingots and men in aluminum suits. So when I was seven, I got to see factories from the inside where my father had worked. And that left a huge impression on me, as did the Welland Canal. I remember as a kid, I'd, as soon as I could kind of have my freedom to bike around, I would bike to the canal and and often you know, trade trinkets with the sailors coming from some country, Italy, Greece, or whatever, with a basket of fruits that I would get in the, in the nearby neighborhoods. And, um, but standing by these massive ships also had a huge effect on me as, as, a, as a young um, aspiring kind of artist photographer. I always wanted to be a, in the arts. I always wanted to create. I painted as, I, as a young kid alongside my father. And I was always involved in creative projects. And at one point when I was 11, I managed to get a camera and a bulk loader. And I started making pictures from 11 onwards. And I was the kid with the camera all the time. And I would um, you know, be able to roll off a roll of 36 because I had 100 foot rolls of film back then, black and white, process it myself, and be able to print these images in my own darkroom with an enlarger. And I can remember the first time at age 11 watching under that orange glow an image. The first image I actually did was of my dog 
and it was a winter time and he was jumping up and down. I, I shot a whole roll of 36 and out of that roll of 36, I picked the one that I thought was the best and blew it up. And little did I know that that was going to be something that I was going to be repeating throughout my life, doing a whole bunch of pictures of something and then picking the one that somehow transcends and goes to another place. And, and that magic of watching my dog appear under that orange glow of a dark room it never really left me. It was like, how incredible I can, you know, before that I was uh, oil painting landscapes and, um, and portraits and things of that nature. And all of a sudden, you know, in one click of a button, I can make an image. And that totally excited me. So I, I began, again, shooting everywhere, doing things, uh, photographing the community centers uh, where I, in the Ukrainian Black Sea Hall, where I went to with my family and, and sold those pictures to keep myself uh, with film and, and chemistry. And um, so as I was going through, I worked at GM, I worked at Ford. So I worked in these factories, putting myself through school. And then eventually I got to um, making a decision after high school. And I was going to go into tool and die making. And I was originally studying mechanical drafting and things of that nature. But I really wanted to be in the creative arts. And what seemed to make sense to me at the time was the graphic arts industry. So I then went to Niagara College and studied graphic arts. And it was there that a teacher I, uh, that I had who I took a course of Sharby with saw me coming back with my assignments. And he said, you know, your, your returns from this, these assignments is so far above and so interesting and so much inter more interesting than anything else anybody is doing is that you have a natural aptitude in photography. His name was Archie Hood. And he said, if I was you, I would uh, like forget graphic arts. I would go to Ryerson and it's one of the best photography programs in the world, for sure, in Canada. And I think you would do well there. So I immediately thought, that's great. I'll, I'll, I finished my two-year course in graphic arts and, uh, and then went and applied to Ryerson and I got in. And that made my big move in 1976 to Toronto. And the thing that I remember, the first thing I remember is, is bumping into one of my most influential teachers, uh, Rob Gublar. And he was my studio teacher. And I remember he had set up the lighting and he was sitting on one of these white cubes that you use for putting props and things on in the studio. And he lit himself in a very interesting way. And he sat there with um, a translucent uh, shell uh, uh, and from a seashell. And he talked about that shell, shell for almost an hour about all the ways you can think about it, the translucency, the texture, the light, how it changes. And, and to me, he was kind of uh, this magical thinking professor who, really got me excited about the idea of how um, photography can transform something, that it has this transformational power if you know how to see it and harness it. And one of the first things he uh, uh, assigned us to was to go out and photograph evidence of man. And that to me was probably the single most interesting and important assignment I'd ever got, because in many ways, I think I'm still doing that same assignment. And my first response to evidence of man was to go to the Welland Canal, go back to something I knew. As a kid, I used to ride my bike all through that area. And I'd seen bits and pieces of the canal here and there still sticking out. The canal had actually taken four routes through St. Catharines. And I, um, I decided to use a four by five camera. I immediately found in love with this large format camera that you would have to take out of the cage at, at Ryerson. Yeah. And with that, I would go out and put a hood over my head and the image, of course, is upside down and you're composing and the image is dark and it takes a lot to get it in focus and figure it all out. But I love that. I love the process. I love the slowing down it did of, of my thinking, of my approach to the subject. And that also reset the tone of my work. So my work became more, I would say, almost formal. When you, when you shoot with a four by five, you know, you're really careful about the edges. You're careful about composition. It's a commitment to material at the time. The film wasn't cheap and it took time to process. And you really wanted to get something that was, was worthy of, of a photograph. So it's not like shooting with a 35 off the hip. It was more on a tripod with a hood over your head and just kind of thinking about what it is I want to do. What's the best light for this? And, you know, how do I get the whole thing in focus? And all those kinds of things that I had to deal with. So, so that, that set the tone of, of how I was going to now work you know, for the rest of my career. And if I look back, 
what Ryerson offered me that I could never get in St. Catharines was first a community of like-minded people who loved photography. And the peer group that, that uh, I had at that time, I still communicate with a lot and are still many of my best friends. And, and, and that group also is the group that leads you forward, that you keep having the conversation once school is over. So that, that provided, Ryerson provided me with that fantastic peer group. And it also provided me with the kind of knowledge that uh, when I was going, the foundation year was film and stills, but there were also these kind of other uh, courses in psychology and sociology and, and history of art and the history of music. And all of a sudden the world opened up in front of me, the ability to really understand how, um, you know, how, you know, art has moved through the ages, what, what has kind of continued to resonate in our time from the past and, and still tells us stories into the future. And for me, that was a fundamental and important uh, education that, again, I could never have gotten that if I was in, in, in St. Catharines and didn't go to a, a university to, to learn those things. And of course, the other thing as a polytechnic, which it was at the time, that I also had the uh, opportunity to really learn my craft. And, and to me, that was something important, the materials and processes, chemistry, you know, how you get the best results, the kind of developers that give you better grain and better contrast, and how do you control your medium? So I was a big believer in really mastering the form, to really be uh, um, some, you know, and I, I guess it was called straight photography at the time. Uh, and, um, and, and so it was like, the image was fully sharp, it was good contrast uh, and the shadows were open, that everything was done in a way that uh, was in, in accordance to what the fine print was, kind of something that Ansel Adams, as, as Paul talked about earlier, espoused to. So it was in that kind of learning both the craft and the larger world of photography and art and being exposed to the contemporary photographers at the time. At the time, some new books were coming out and you know, uh, the new topographic book, which was very influential, uh, came to the George Eastman House and a book was made around that. So I was really, again, um, totally immersed in, in something that I absolutely loved. And I continued. And then eventually in my second year, I bought a 4x5 camera of my own. I bought a Linhau camera. And, and that became my, my tool that I could pack down and take to wherever I was I was going, and if I traveled afar or in my car, it was always with me. So, so that became again my tool of choice. That it was something that um, uh, was, I had a, a range of lenses, so from something very wide to something very long. And the, the big break happened to me in in like 1981, 82, where I broke away from black and white. If you saw the images in the background, the, there a lot of them are. Um, our black and white images, but all of a sudden I thought, I want to work in color. I think, and I thought, like, not that many people uh, or photographers at that time were working in color. Most of the um, artists that, that like, almost all the artists in the new topographic, uh, uh, short of uh, Stephen Shore, uh, were in black and white. But there was another uh, color photographer, um, you know, that, that I also liked. and. and uh, and, and again, there was this influence that was constantly coming at me. And I thought, well, if I went into color, there's a real opportunity to be more pioneering, that it's not largely not seen at that, or at least wasn't seen at that time in the early 80s as an artistic uh, medium. It was seen more for uh, doing things like annual reports or uh, pho photographing cars or, or, or perfume bottles or liquor bottles. That was the large format camera in the studio being used all the time. Uh, but there weren't that many. And even at the time, some of my instructors were saying, are you sure you want to go to color? And you, are you sure you want to uh, go to landscape photography? Because I was fascinated with landscape. It's something that I just did naturally. I didn't have to force myself. It, it was just something that I enjoyed doing. Um, in growing up, I also had a real connection with the outdoors and, and a love of nature and going uh, camping and hiking and, and, and these excursions took me deep into, into, into the forests of um, Algonquin Park, et cetera. So I had this fascination with nature and looking at what, what was there before we change it. And I think that was also an important 
part of my development to get to the body of work that I produce. Because if you, in a way, if I didn't have that love of nature, I don't think I would ever uh, want to spend almost a whole life trying to show how we as humans are pushing the natural order back, how we are, um, our own success is at the detriment to the natural world and to biodiversity. And that's something that I saw in the, in the 80s when I was studying and we were hearing about the population explosion that was about to happen and we were in the middle of it. In fact, when I was born, there was 2.5 billion people and I look at it today and we're almost 8 billion. So we've more than tripled in, in, in size in my lifetime in, in, in my 60 plus years. So something was afoot. I understood that something was afoot. Something at scale was afoot. And, uh, and I thought, well, with this camera, I can go out and begin to make sense of that scale, to make sense of what it is that we as humans are doing. Uh, I, I had an opportunity while well, I was putting myself through Ryerson to work in uh, a gold mine up in Northern uh, Ontario around Red Lake. And a friend of mine worked at, uh, down about 40 kilometers away at an open pit mine, an iron ore open pit mine in Ear Falls. And he invited me for an afternoon to watch a blast to see how they're blasting ore. And it was the first time I'd ever stood on the edge of an open pit mine. Um, I'm about, at this point, I'm just a little over 20 years old and I'm watching this and I saw the blast and it was incredible. The, the, the scale of the blast, the, the, you know, the, the, the rock shot up almost a kilometer into the air. Um, and uh, you know, it was the first time that I really began to understand when I saw those big trucks with the tires that are over 12 feet high and moving all of this ore, the scale of what, uh, how we operate in the landscape to get these materials that we use every day, such as iron ore. But it never really occurred to me then that that would be my subject. It was just, I was naturally interested in it. I love bringing out the large format camera to, to, to photograph it. And then when I graduated from Ryerson, I decided to apply for a, a grant uh, to continue my work. And uh, luckily in, in um, 1983, I got my first grant. And it allowed me to continue working. And in 1983, I got a substantial grant, a B grant. I got an early one in 82, and then I got a substantial one in 83, which allowed me to travel for almost four months. Uh, and that was really where I um, established my thesis for, for what I thought would be, or what is, what's become uh, my work for my whole life to date. And the thesis was basically to go in and try and sh show the largest examples of the human taking from the land, whether it's quarries and taking stone by the, by, by the cube, or is blasting like an iron ore mine where the mine is more uh, following the ore body without a structure. These, these ones that we're looking at here, were really exciting for me because in my imagination, I thought there must be landscapes where um, the stone being removed as a block at a time would create these architect architectonic residual spaces. And, um, and also what was, what was wonderful is when these things were abandoned, nature would start to spring back. So you've got these spots of color. And so that whole idea that I could imagine something, I had never seen a, a, a quarry, and then to go and research them, find them, and then get access into those places. And it was easy for me to get access because I, I was a miner. I knew how to speak the language. I had all the gear. I had my original helmet that I had when I worked at the mine. I had the boots from the mine. mine. So I would actually go over there and, and fully equip someone who can walk in there that was aware of, of how those places operated and how to be safe in them. And I would show the, the owners uh, you know, my portfolio of what I had. They'd often get very excited about it, seeing what I would do with their place, and I'd get access. So access was always a really, really important project or part of this, these projects to find a way to get into these places. So once I did that, in, in 1993, Carrera Marble Quarries was a, a breakthrough for me as well. And it was a breakthrough in that I, um, I, I was able to Think of where else can I go to do these quarries? What else could I um, show? And, and I thought Carrera was an interesting place in Italy where they've been quarrying for over 2,500 years. A whole different feel and look to it, but I'd never uh, traveled abroad. I'd never really gone anywhere 
uh, outside of North America to do my work. So I packed up my eight by 10 at that time because I was starting to work with an eight by 10 and my four by five. I found uh, an assistant in Italy who spoke Italian, but also whose father had worked in these quarries and was able to get me access into these places. So I get on a plane, fly over to Italy and begin getting access into this, um, you know, exotic, crazy place in the northern mountains of Italy um, to be able to show these uh, fantastic quarries. And that's something that, again, uh, was the, the very first to um, what I would call a peripatetic life of every year spending, you know, a several two to three or four months every year somewhere in the world uh, doing something that I've researched, whether it's in China or India, Bangladesh, the shipbreaking works uh, and places like that. So that was the beginning of, of, of my international, let's look at the whole planet, let's see the globe, let's look where, where these things are happening. Where's the biggest um, copper mine in the world? Where's the biggest iron ore mine in the world? Where's the largest quarries in the world? So that became um, my kind of operating uh, thinking for pretty much throughout my whole career. And then I went from subjects to subjects. I went into looking at recycling as a way of secondary mining. So we use it in the primary, uh, we, we take things from nature, uh, turn them into uh, aluminum cans or rubber tires, and then it goes into a secondary um, uh, process where we gather it in, in, from industry and from rural areas and reprocess it and put it back into the system, creating a more sustainable world. So for me, that was, again, a, a link to how we as, as humans are, uh, are using our resources. And in, again, that thesis of what I wanted to do, I wanted to show the origins of where things come from, where they're made, how they're made, and that took me to China. And then also not as interested in, in the consumption, you know, where, where, where the cities where things are happening and we consume all these things, but then moving from that to the waste stream, where does all this go? Uh, what, 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 you know, because there is no such place as a way. Where is that a way? So this became my whole project in the mid nineties of looking at recycling and looking at where that secondary processing of all of these materials that we harvest from nature are again being put into um, a more virtuous cycle where you know we have a sustainable future if we can keep these materials uh, in the loop, uh, in a closed loop system where they keep coming back to us after they've been consumed the first time. So that really was um, a, a big uh, you know uh, you know arc of, of the work that I've done, and I, I'm currently still uh, looking at doing work in, in industry. And I'm also looking at um, how I can use film as I've done some films during this time with uh, collaborators, Jennifer Bechewald, Nick DePoncier. And we've done three films over the last 14 years, which have also added to, the, to this conversation about how we as humans uh, are tipping the planet. And the show that I worked with, uh, with Paul was an oil show. And these are some looking at some of the images I did from oil. And I really wanted to, again, uh, show the machinery that sits in the background of our existence that provides for all the things that, um, that we take for granted every day. We get in our car and start it, or we go uh, on a bus that's driven by diesel, or we get on a plane that's, that's um, you know, fueled with jet fuel, or we're heating our houses with gas. Uh, that is a gas pipe that goes comes from the west coast to, to us in one continuous pipe and into our into our kitchens. And I'm looking at all of these things and I'm trying to put a landscape or a, a visualization of you know where where all the, these things are happening. And uh, so in, in in many ways uh, I'm excited and I've just recently done a, a big thing with Dundas Square which we'll be releasing. Uh, with Luminato Festival, and that's something that's coming up of a, showing the arc of my work. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, that was a, a wonderful introduction to uh, to how you started, and um, and playing in the background just to uh, clarify for people who are watching that slideshow, um, what you were looking at uh, was the uh, in, in approximately chronological order. Uh, the first two deposits 
of Ed's work. Um, and I thought a good way to kick off our conversation was uh, uh, to tell people how it is that we are deciding how to represent your work. Because one of the first challenges that Ed and I faced when we started talking about what would comprise uh, your archive at Ryerson was the question of what to include. And uh, you are extraordinarily prolific. You, you've, uh, you have very few, if any, uh, fallow periods in your career starting right from the beginning. And, um, and while some things we are going to include in, in a very comprehensive way, if we were to include every single uh, print of every image that you had made, uh, this would become a, a vast pile <laughs> of, uh, of images. And of course, many prints are no longer available because a number of your editions have sold out. Uh, in some cases, photographs are represented in your archive, especially early ones, by only one or two prints um, that, uh, that in any way represent the, the quality that you want them to. So uh, one of the first challenges, and there's no easy answer to exactly how we approach this, was that uh, uh, Denise and I went into the, um, uh, the archive and started looking at boxes, uh, some of which hadn't, Ed hadn't himself looked at in many, many years. Uh, and we started thinking about how to represent the very, very beginnings of his career. Um, as you probably saw looking at the uh, slideshow, uh, roughly speaking, uh, what's represented there is the very earliest student work that Ed did at Ryerson, uh, which is the earliest Stepstone work in his own archive. Um, uh, first year, second year, all the way through his, um, his thesis project. Uh, and then uh, in the 1980s, the development of his mature style, um, uh, which for us, uh, Denise and I, was one of our most fascinating um, experiences working on that first deposit, uh, discovering the wide range of things that Ed uh, approached and looked at on the way to uh, defining his lifetime uh, approach, the approach that he would pursue over and over again. And then, uh, and then of course, sometime in the 1980s, Ed started issuing editions, his very first uh, gallery exhibited saleable edition prints, which uh, over time began to define his output because he would often uh, think about his work uh, in context of a book or an exhibition. Uh, that particularly emerged as a kind of an organizing strategy for him in the 1990s. And our second deposit, uh, the second year's donation, really focused on the 1990s. And, and we decided um, uh, as a kind of rough way of thinking about each annual donation that we would look at the decades. Once we got to the 1990s, we would actually look at a nine or 10 year period and think about what you had produced in that time frame. And as we looked at the additions, we had to think very carefully about how to represent each body of work um, fully and also succinctly, not over-representing, but also not under-representing a body of work. And some bodies of work are being represented in a, a, a very thorough way, uh, particularly I think at it's important to mention that you've had a few commissions in your career uh, for example, we just saw on the screen a project that you did about banks, and that one I think we decided to represent completely because it will only exist, I think, when all is said and done in two different collections, um, including, uh, uh, where is the other collection at? It's the Houston, Houston Museum of Fine Arts and uh, the Canadian Center for Architecture. So this will be the third. The th yeah. There was three sets done, so that was the third set that you got. Yeah. yeah. And, um, uh, and that was a key part of our thinking as well. We, we didn't want to overlap with other institutions that were nearby. So we were very conscientious about not uh, doing, uh, not replicating, say, the collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is not very far away from us. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that I really wanted to drill in on, because, uh, and I already mentioned this um, uh, as something that fascinated Denise and I, is when we saw your very first um, uh, of what I would call your mature bodies of work. And these uh, perhaps are ones that, uh, that you were referring to loosely when you mentioned that assignment that you got, Evidence of Man. Um, uh, that assignment came at Ryerson, but you did pursue it in really, really interesting and varied ways, really variegated ways. Uh, in, for example, a series on taxidermy, um, workers uh, in factories and on farms, and 
uh, even all the way up through your project on the Ford assembly line, uh, there is in that work much greater evidence of, um, of uh, human presence. Uh, very often these pictures are made at ground level. There are many of them are even portraits and also representation of animals um, of uh, different species. And, uh, and this was a, not necessarily a surprise to us. Uh, we figured that you had to start somewhere in your work and that it wasn't just gonna be landscape work you were doing, but we were interested in how much of that early work was in fact uh, about people. And, uh, and I think a lot of your viewers have this perception that your work is all made far above the ground and doesn't uh, represent the lives of everyday people. Uh, that's of course not true. In, in every body of work that you've done, there are people present to varying degrees. Um, but I wondered if you could talk to us about your evolution through that, uh, through that early assignment evidence of man in greater detail so that we understand how you came to, uh, to see the work about infrastructure and industry and recycling and all of the other things that you pursued as stemming from that, uh, from that first idea. Yeah, well, I think um, almost everything that I, I think about is, in a way, our relationship to nature that and somehow um, <clears throat> in our, you know, through our, our society and through religion and through all kinds of, um, you know, historical uh, and, you know, millennial kind of movements of, of how we've shaped our thinking, we've somehow put ourselves outside of nature that we are, you know, somehow a, a special being here that that has um, you know th that sits and presides in a way over the natural order and we name it and it is ours and and so this kind of relationship was uh, and our and our relationship with with nature has always been at, at the kind of core of my thinking in that it seems because if we look at our the first nations who were here their um, relationship to nature was very different they were part of it they had to work within its cycles they had to be careful in terms of how long they stayed in an area before they had to move to another area or else it would deplete all the resources. So these were very practical things, but this was part of their lives and this notion of living living uh, with seven gener generations uh, into the future. And when I look at how we in the West have treated nature, it's the cupboard that we go to get stuff and we leave it, you know, these wastelands for dead. And also, if I look at, you know, the, when I looked at taxidermy workshops, it was the same thing. It was um that in the past not that distant past um when when we went hunting for wild animals it was for protein and now a lot of times yes the protein's there almost as a secondary because we don't need to really hunt for protein you can go to the grocery store and you know get a steak or 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 whatever that you need or chicken and you don't necessarily have to, we don't have to hunt anymore so the hunt has now been transformed into this um you know trophy that 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 it's a, a kind of a sign of masculinity that, you know, I, I've gone out and I've bagged the big, you know, deer with, you know, 12 points and, um, and, and whatever, and I'm going to mount it on my wall. So when I did that exhibition, I, I, my, it was actually called, it was probably in the uh, 82, I think, or 83, I did it um, at the Photographer's Gallery in Vancouver, and it was called Polyfoam Resurrections. It's this, polyfoam is the base material used to, to wrap, so if the, if somebody came in with a two-year-old deer a buck that they, they that they've shot with the antlers the taxidermist would say okay this species two-year-old buck set in denver was the epicenter which i went to photograph that as well of taxidermies and then they would uh, order that foam and then they would shave it a bit to fit the to the, the skin of uh, or the the leather of the uh, of the deer or whatever onto the foam and then mount the antlers on that as a mount so i was kind of fascinated in this whole industry of trophy um, and so, so it's all, even my early second year, uh, assignment, I was thinking, I, I was photographing, uh, architecture all around. I walked around Rosedale and Forest Hill and, and places where they had large, beautiful textured homes with stone and whatever, and looking at how we integrate nature, use it to break the kind of monotony of, of a repetitious stone and, and to, to soften up a building. So I was looking at how. Uh, you know, we use nature as a kind of a complement to our to, to, to a visual complement to our architecture. So at the always at the kind of underlying uh, idea was was this kind of un, um, I was always uneasy about it because I thought, you know, 
this is something that um, you know Adam Smith and his definition of, of, of economy and, and, and perpetual growth that you know that graph by allowing the invisible hand of the market to set prices and, and, and establish prices and that if it's left on its own it should find its set, find a kind of equilibrium and, and move along and allow for um, you know profits and, and for people to be gainfully employed all that, has proven to work. I mean, we've gotten this far on, on, on the notion of a free market economy and a consumer-based system. But the thing that 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 early iteration or theory on, on the economy missed is that we live in a finite planet of materials. And that if we don't, um, you know, if we're not careful and if we're wasteful with those materials, uh, then we're gonna run, in, run into a situation of moving from a land of plenty to a land of scarcity. And I think, um, you know, we are dangerously running close to that, whether it's the fish in the oceans or easily accessible oil or easily accessible iron ore or copper, all these things are gonna be going up as we have to go further and further to get these things. So that's something I fully comprehended and understood in the early eighties that, uh, that this trajectory we were on is fraught with problems. And if I keep photographing these things, eventually it, all of it in aggregate would make uh, sense as a body of work produced by an artist. Yeah. Uh, you know, that brings up an interesting point that we've thought about um, with your archive and that you and I have talked about at times. Um, I wonder if you could, uh, um, you know, briefly characterize your own views about how that uh, endangered environment, how global climate change um, uh, threatens the preservation of your own work. Uh, that, you know, here we are trying to preserve your original prints, your working materials, uh, even digital files ultimately perhaps. Um, and climate change makes all of that quite a bit harder and it makes everything feel quite existential. Um, so I, I wonder is that, uh, how, how does that preoccupy you? Does it preoccupy you? Do you ignore it? Well, I don't know if, I mean, I think it, in terms of, um, you know, my, I mean, short of, you know, um, heat waves where we have massive fires or, you know, I think that, that like, I, I don't have uh, a sense of there's an imminent threat to my studio. Um, I mean, I think if there's a threat at all, it's a threat of a kind of a devolution of society in that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, if, you know, you know, a, 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 a massive economic meltdown or, or destabilization from immigration or anything that might be caused by climate change may make our worlds uh, more challenging and it may make it, you know, harder to, you know, you know, have your stuff secure in a, a more insecure world. Um, but I feel that what I did not as far back as where you went with all the early student work, but all the work that I started to release. So every image that I ever uh, released as an, as an edition print, I have um, mastered and digitized. It was a five-year project where uh, I had created a master print and uh, a digital file at the maximum resolution of, those, of, of that negative or whatever that would then, and that exists both in the cloud, in a hard drive offsite, and in my studio, so I have it in three locations, which is a you know one of every image that that I've ever released, you know, with other material that's also valuable as well, and I think it's in my archive. So I have been kind of unlike, and unlike um, I'm sure a lot of other photographers, I I I really wanted to kind of create um, uh, you know my own archives. So for instance, um, you know uh, you know there there are uh, Paul Sargent who graduated from from Ryerson, from the uh, Preservation Conservation Program. Um, and he did his whole thesis on what would you uh, do to a contemporary uh, a color photographer uh, to, to secure their archives, to make their archives um, kind of stable. And, and so he did this whole thesis and he gave it to me as, after he graduated. And I, I went through it and I read it and I said, great, you're going to do it. So I hired him 10 years ago and he's still my archivist. So, um, so I thank Ryerson for uh, creating great, excellent students who can uh, enter into an archive like that and keep it organized because God forbid I was the organizer of the archive, it wouldn't be as good as it is with Paul doing it. 
<laughs> and uh, it's a nice shout out to Paul. I, I want to thank him as well, because Denise and I depended on him heavily and your team. Uh, you have a great team at your studio that you've worked with for many, many years, and uh, uh, they've all been a huge help to us as we go through this multi-year process. Um, uh, I want to turn to uh, some of the questions that we're receiving online. We're getting a lot of questions. Um, uh, and one that, I, uh, that I'm really interested to hear about is uh, somebody um, asked about uh, how your family supported you when you were coming up. Um, uh, how did they react to your choice of career? And, and did they support you as you pursued that crazy dream of being an artist uh, with the camera? Uh, great question. Um, uh, well, uh, I had like, my mother couldn't support me. My father died um, when I was uh, 15 um, and he was pretty much uh, out of commission for the last year and a half. So I was more like 13 and a half when he started going into the hospitals and, and largely, and, and it's interestingly because uh, when I was 18, I got a job back at GM where my dad worked, removing the PCB oils that was attributed to all the guys that worked on my dad's line had all died from these PCB oils. So it was this kind of strange moment where I'm actually, um, you know, removing the oil that it was the known killer to all the people who worked uh, in that part of the factory where PCB oils were being used. Um, so I pretty much always, I always had a job. I, I was always entrepreneurial. I, I, I could never rely on my mother. I had no allowance. It, I had to work find ways to make money. I did all kinds of things. Uh, you know, I worked in bowling alleys, I, you know, uh, waited. Uh, I, I, I probably think by the time I was 20, I probably had about 18 jobs that I had done at different times and, and different places. And then I started working in big industry because I wanted to go into photography. So I worked at GM, I worked at Ford, I worked at a mining company. Uh, I, um, I, when I looked at, when I add up all the time I worked in production lines and assembly lines, it was two years of my life I was working in those lines, but making money that allowed me to buy cameras. So I'd be able to finish the summer and go out and buy a, a decent camera and start working. So, um, so I've always had to kind of rely on my own resources. Again, when I was actually, I came across some paperwork. So when I uh, applied to Ryerson in 1976, it was $250 a term. You know, so five hundred dollars got two terms, and uh, so I could even earn that money. I mean, that, it was within my grasp to put myself through school. Um, at that time as well, uh, I split a house when, when I got to Ryerson. Uh, we got our first apartment. It was three hundred and fifty bucks split three ways. It was like one hundred and fifteen bucks each, and I had a room with a big kitchen, a living room. Uh, it was two floors of a house with a three bedroom, you know, apartment for one hundred fifteen bucks. So, you know, a gallon of gas at the time cost 50 cents. So it was a very different time. And you could go and work in a gym job or something like that and save four or five thousand dollars over a summer living with my mom at home. I didn't have to pay anything. So I was able to put my savings away. So other than a few things I wanted for myself and that I, I the rest of it was saving. So so I was able to kind of, and, and, I, and sadly, I don't think that's possible today. I mean, just tuition alone um, and all of that, it kind of puts a, a student to be able to do it unless they get a scholarship. It's almost impossible, I think, to get an education today without support from family. But that was a period where you know prices and, and earnings were such that it was still within the grasp. But I also think that it, it um, taught me not to rely on anything but myself. You know that that you know uh, I was never afraid of work. Uh, I knew that to succeed you had to work hard, um, and I never gave that, gave up the dream. I just kept uh, uh, you know thinking that one day I'd like to be able to just be able to do photography. And then I think it really broke for me, where I was able to really start to step away was uh, after the shipbreaking work in Bangladesh and the success of that work all of a sudden allowed me to pull away from Toronto Image Works, which was something that I set up in 1985 to provide darkroom rentals for all the people graduating from Ryerson who had nowhere to print. And so, um, so I said, well, if I make this, and I saw a place in Buffalo that was doing it, and I said, well, if it could work in Buffalo, it can certainly work in Toronto. And I got some investors to help me um, you know, fund it uh, at the time in 1985 to open up Image Works cost $250,000. I didn't have it. I set up a company and sold shares to the company to set up Toronto Image Works in 1985. I think I had 20,000 of my own dollars that I had saved up, but that was it. Um, and, uh, and started that company, which is still operating today. 
Um, Ed, we've received a number of questions that are um, really interesting because they they go to the heart of um, the political overlay to your work, or or you might call it the you know the uh, the political context uh, that your work appears in. And um, I'm always really fascinated by these questions because uh, I think a lot of people imagine that you don't think about. Uh, about the context in which your work is seen as much as I know that you do. And, and I'm fortunate to know that because you and I've been able to talk about these things over and over again. Uh, part of that is that when we worked together on the oil exhibition, a big consideration for us was that the exhibition was at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington, which is you know right across the street from the old executive office building, part of the White House complex. And the audience in Washington that, that we knew you would receive for that work was an audience of legislators and the people that work for them, uh, energy specialists, lobbyists, lawyers, um, uh, who are actually focused on uh, not just global climate change, but energy production and consumption um, and all kinds of issues that are related. Um, so just very briefly, uh, one person asks, uh, how effective is your work in changing public policy? Uh, another uh, uh, person questions um, whether your photographs are, in fact, um, uh, too beautiful to affect change, whether they, uh, by, uh, by being essentially um, gorgeous, uh, whether that somehow belies the, uh, the difficulty of the subject matter. Uh, that you approach. And I wonder if you could address that um, right now. Yeah, well, uh, the first off, do, you know, it does art affect change? Now, I think you know, if we look in, in, in the history books, sure, I mean, I think Watkins images preserved uh, some of the parks and Ansel Adams work preserved some national parks in, in, in the West Coast of the United States. So, you know, we have, you know, places, you know, Lewis Hines work, you know, brought in child labor laws as well. So, there, you know, there are historic precedents for photography uh, shaping policies and 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 actually, you know, doing real things in the world that have real real effects on people and 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 the landscape as well. I think it's much harder today in in our busy, loud world to 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 see that, um, you know, uh, you know, art can actually reshape policy. I think that what um, you know, I see my role more as a, a kind of a, a, media, a medium through which those lost worlds that we never get a chance to see that are part of our existing world, the wastelands, the, the mines, these things. And there's equivalency, I think, between, you know, to have that city, that, that moment where I was standing and looking at the IMP building, one of the things that occurred to me is, you know, there has to be some big, you know, uh, incursion into the landscape that's equal or greater to the feeling of of standing at those towers, that there had to be a hole, you know, uh, uh, the mounds and the voids. So there's a, there's a reciprocal hole to this, and so in so in capturing cities, I would also try and find them at, at the moment where they radiate, where the light is amazing. You can see down the streets, and it's not like contrasty. And so I'm just really applying the same kind of approach that I would approach to photographing a city, which I, when I did the bank architecture, I, I forgot a lot of cities, uh, to to the landscape that that I was just trying to make it so that, and I, I didn't think as much of it as being beautiful or I was more like, what is visually compelling? What's gonna get a viewer to stop and look at this and become engaged with it? Because I feel that in the visual arts, and I go back to the fact that I, I fell in love with, you know, guys like Edward Weston and Ansel Adams and, you know, even Colin Watkins from earlier in that the craft, the, the ability to make these prints kind of radiate and to, you know, and this kind of transcendent uh, ability that photography has to take something in our mundane world that, as I often said, if you went, if I took you to a quarry and we walked around and you're not a photographer, you don't know, uh, and you're not attenuating or zooming into the thing that I, I'm looking at, you probably wouldn't see that. Most people wouldn't see something interesting. It's the spending time there and attenuating into it and understanding when the light would be able to show it in a way that kind of transforms it. It becomes transformational. It becomes something that that is something to behold when you're standing in front of it. And to me, that was the interesting thing as an artist, that I wanted to capture the viewer. I wanted them to look and stand in front of the print 
and go, where is this? And what's going on here? Why is this like this? And to me, that was, as a visual artist, you know, a, a way to communicate with my audience to let the piece kind of uh, come through. And also, it's, it was also, I, I wasn't naive to think that if I made like more damaging images, indicting pictures and put indictments alongside statements alongside those images, you know, we, we should cease and desist copper mining or iron ore mining. And this is a terrible thing we're doing. Number one, that's naive to say that. We still are gonna need copper to put a build our electric cars in our new world. And all these things are still gonna be, be harvest. But to me, it, it was, you know, that I, I, I wanted to show, not tell, revelatory, not accusatory. So I, when I went into these places to get access to, because I had in my career, phenomenal access to places where people can't believe, like how'd you get into a chicken packing plant in China? Uh, you know, well, you, 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 you bet your bottom dollar, I, I, and I've seen it. They all have printouts of from, from you know, my page and any Google searches they've done. You know, when I got on a Three Gorges Dam, I actually saw the file that they had on me, all printouts. If I was an, uh, uh, if I was an active environmentalist, an activist, there's just no way they would just say, go away. You know, there's so part of the ability to show that was that I walked this fine line, that I, that that I create something that is that that sits. So these these works can sit um, uh, in in the boardroom of Greenpeace, and they can sit in the boardroom of the company where they actually uh, created the thing. You know, or, or it could sit in the boardroom of a bank. So it, these things have this incredible ability to kind of have a floating point meaning that allows it to be seen in all kinds of contexts. And I don't actually believe that today art changes it. Maybe it shapes consciousness and people, individuals get more conscious about the world they've done. And I think films do that in a very powerful way because they, they hit us more emotionally. We're taken for a ride. We're hearing the words, we're hearing the music, we're being carried by the momentum of the visuals. A still has a much harder time, I think, to give you that emotional ride, whereas a film does. And that's why I'm quite interested in doing immersive experiences like I did at Dundas Square recently, and I'll be doing next year, and creating an immersive uh, experience in the wake of progress as a piece, uh, and also film. So I'm, I'm interested in that kind of ride through, that kind of floating through these worlds, and to feel them in another way to understand there's a there's another side to our existence that we're not very uh, aware of and this helps you become aware of it um you know I, I i wouldn't be as you know so arrogant to say that i've actually made art that's changed policy but it may help shape consciousness individual consciousness yeah. i think that it's a really valuable people uh, thing for people to understand i mean ansel adams for example to this day is misunderstood as a kind of anodyne landscape photographer when in fact he was uh, a, a, a fierce environmentalist but one who was very careful very cautious because he wanted to affect change um, both in policy terms which he had a real impact on and also because he wanted to win people over to the idea of caring about the natural environment. Um, so I always think these questions are more complicated uh, than uh, people might imagine who think that activism is the only approach um, to yeah. awareness or solving a problem. Uh, we only have time for about one more question and I'm gonna consolidate uh, a couple that we've received. Um, there are a lot of questions about your working method. Uh, one person, for example, asks about research, the importance of research. and. I can answer that very briefly. Ed does more research than any artist I've ever met <laughs> on the subjects that he photographs. Um, uh, he's profoundly knowledgeable. Um, but a number of the other questions are about how you make your images. Uh, uh, there are a number of questions about digital, um, and you made the switch to digital, uh, whether how you feel about digital viewing of your images, which I think is a really interesting question. Uh, so in other words, people not seeing a print on the wall, people not seeing uh, a beautiful book, but in fact, only having access to your images over the internet on a screen. And another person asks about the role of storyboarding uh, before you make your image, which I think connects the digital and the question about research. So I wonder if you could briefly talk about um, how digital has in fact changed 
how you work and how you approach your subjects in advance uh, with the caveat that we only have a couple minutes left. Right. Okay, well, I'll just quickly say that in the past, before the World Wide Web and before something like Google Earth, like for instance, if I wanted to go and do the mines in, in uh, BC, which I did the uh, you know, Highland Copper Mines, I would go to the government uh, map store and they would have mineral deposits in, in Canada and where the concentrations of mineral deposits were. Not knowing the names of the mines, I would just drive and then we'd get a, a road map and map put it over top of that and go to the area and say, are there any mines around here? You know, um, and, uh, you know, that's that that was pre-internet, you know, um, and with the internet, obviously, things got a lot easier to figure out where to go. And when I did quarries, I went to a quarry um, fair, trade fair, where they where they sold equipment. I found that there was a trade fair. And then I went and asked them and looked at pictures and asked them, you know, where where can I find big quarries? Um, so, you know, and then now I have people both researching, like when I went to Italy, even back then, I'd get people to photograph it, you know, just get, and they'd go out there, I'd, I'd hire a, you know, a, an assistant, a photography assistant, I'd go and he'd go and photograph it, I'd be doing my own research, they'd be doing their research, sending me real images back, even in Bangladesh, which is the very beginning of the internet in 2000, you know, I had guys go out there, shoot, digitize the images, so they have to digitize their film, it wasn't digital cameras yet, um, and then they sent me the digital files, and then, you know, I was able to kind of go back and forth on emails, and this is in the year 2000, um, and be able to figure out the shipbreaking work. Today, it's, of course, really far more sophisticated. I have, you know, different researchers that I use, uh, both usually in the location where I'm going, who can be in the field and capture stuff, that, that, that this is what it looks like now, and researchers here that help me, you know, get closer to you know, the, the areas that I think would, would yield the kind of imagery that I'm looking for. So, um, yeah, so I do, again, in the books, all that research ends up being used in the books as well. So if you look at any of the books, they really tell the story. So if you go through all my Steidl books, you know, there's a lot of information packed into those books that's been well-researched, that's accurate, that tells the story. And if you look at the films, I think you're also, you know, going to see that, you know, this is a story about what we're doing to the planet. You know, it's just another way of telling it. And I think it opens the, the tent more. If it was a more of a Michael Moore kind of indicting kind of film, you speak to the choir. By having it more open-ended and more philosophic, it, it, it stands the test of time better. And also, it, those on the edge who might not be believers in climate change might come into that tent by seeing this kind of evidence-based, you know, imagery and film and still. So it is also this idea of extending into people who aren't the choir and go beyond the choir. Right. Uh, on that note, um, I'm afraid to say we have to bring things to an end. Uh, um, we have a lot of unanswered questions. I want to thank everybody who submitted them. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to them. And uh, finally, thank you, Ed. Uh, thank you so much, uh, obviously, for trusting us with your archive um, and seeing us as a good place to address your legacy over time. And thank you for today. Thank you for uh, uh, talking about the donation and your early work and for answering questions. We really do appreciate it. And thank you and you and your team for uh, taking care of the work. So thank you. And what the work that you do is fantastic. Thanks, Thanks so much. Take care. Uh, goodbye, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.